This week, after six years on the road, we're sharing some thoughts on things that have changed for us over the years and things that have changed in the camping and RV industry. This is RV Miles. This summer, L.L. Bean invites you to simply step outside and enjoy the fresh air and sunshine. We'll be your guide with tips and advice to get more out of every moment outdoors. Here's one. On your next camping trip, turn a headlamp into a lantern in five seconds. Strap the headlamp around an empty clear water bottle or milk jug and turn it on. The soft white light will brighten up a tent. For more fun ideas, easy how-tos, and inspiring stories, visit llbean.com guide. Welcome to episode 249 of RV Miles. I'm Jason. And I'm Abby. And we are two full-time RVers who, along with our three boys, have been crisscrossing North America on one epic road trip since 2016. Here at RV Miles, we talk all things RV and outdoors, from travel destinations to industry news, our national parks, and so much more. We are recording this on our six-year nomadiversary Depending Literally. on what day you count, but uh, as as folks like to call it, their nomadiversary. Their nomadiversary <laughs> is the anniversary of when they uh, went full time on the road. It has been six years for us. It's amazing. This time six years ago was the end of I think three or four very very long days. It was it was a lot to move out. It really was. It was a lot to move <laughs> out, and our landlord at the time literally had the painters. Beating yeah. down on the apartment door, trying to get in there to paint that place because that is how quick they had turned that apartment yeah. around. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to share some thoughts. Uh, it was actually prompted by a question somebody had yeah. about about our time on the road and the things that we've uh, noticed that have changed over the years. I want to start the show this week, though, with an article from our friends over at RV Life. They collaborated with our other friends over at Harvest Host for an article about the funniest camping stories that people have. And I just want to sort of go in and share one with you here. This is the second place winner. This past spring, we arranged to stay at a Harvest Host farm location in South Carolina. The farm hosts were gracious and welcoming. We were able to purchase well-made alpaca hats and socks from their gift shop. The highlight of the visit was touring the small farm, participating in a few chores by feeding the goats and alpacas, and enjoying the company and antics of a mini donkey named Eddie. We settled in for the night, thankful for the crisp air and quiet country atmosphere. About 3 a.m., we were awakened by the vigorous rocking of our 24-foot motorhome. I need to mention that my husband and I are earthquake magnets, having lived through large earthquakes in Chile, Turkey, Egypt, and Mexico. Did we really just attract an earthquake to South Carolina? After what seemed an eternity, the rocking paused and we discovered that Eddie was just in need of a good back scratch, which he was able to satisfy on the railing of the bike rack attached to the RV. We had a good laugh, our fears allayed for the time being. I can't say we were able to return to peaceful slumber, however. <laughs> Eddie had discovered a good thing, and he returned numerous times to the bike rack to satisfy oh. his need for a good scratch. It made for a funny memory, and we hope to be able to return again someday. This time, we will come armed with some anti-itch cream for Eddie. <laughs> We love Harvest Host. We have a yes. couple of Harvest Host days coming up, actually, on our way out to Colorado. We do. We're doing a, I believe, a sort of classic car, motor speedway museum. And sure. then we're also... You booked it. I don't know. <laughs> I did. And I, I cannot remember the name off the top of my head. I was looking at a lot of them because I love that you can, in Harvest Hosts, you can put in your route. You're going from here to here. And then it'll give you the path you're taking. And it'll show you everything along there that you can stay at. And so... I looked at a lot of places because we're headed into Colorado. So we're doing that. And then we're also naturally going to a winery. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I know a lot of people share Harvest Host, a lot of influencers, a lot of YouTubers share Harvest Host. Uh, and we all have a discount code that we all get a kickback from. <laughs> you get a discount code and you get one. Not even going to tell you ours because we no. just, we actually really enjoy it. Uh, this is not about that. Harvest Host is a, uh, a great organization. It's a great opportunity for 
people to stay overnight in a relatively safe environment um, that's sort of a little bit organized without having to, you know, fear whether the actual parking is going to be available for you or not. Well, yeah, it's just with Walmart being what's kind of going on as you've talked about in the news and there's a lot of will they, won't they with that right now. It's really nice to have something where you can actually speak to someone or go online. I love when I get to make an online reservation. You know that you have it. Yeah. That I think is the biggest thing for me is I just, I know that we have it. So we do have a couple. We've got a big push coming up. We've got RVE, the RV Entrepreneur Summit happening. It starts on September 7th. Uh, in order for us to make that, because we're still in the Quad Cities, it's 1,100 miles to get to Montrose, Colorado. We're going to do that in, I think we've given ourselves three days. Three days, yeah. And so we're going to be leaving on Sunday. And again, that was a last minute decision. So thankful for Harvest Hosts because we're camping over the Labor Day weekend. Yeah. This is something we will probably talk a lot about in the B Block when we talk about our six years on the road. This is classic to forget that it's a <laughs> holiday weekend. So I'm really thankful we had that option because campgrounds, that was not going to be happening. So we'll share that article from uh, the folks at RV Life in the description for this episode where you can check out the other stories. They're pretty funny as well. We want to remind you that our book is now on sale. It is now officially on sale. We've been talking about the pre-sale for a while, but is now officially on sale. The National Parks Journal for Kids is available on Amazon. And uh, we'll put a link to that in the description as well. $9.99, you get four different parks. Uh, it's park agnostic, so you can sort of use it at any national park. It's kind of like a mini junior ranger program. Actually, a large junior ranger program, yeah, just it, a not park specific one. Yeah, and it couldn't have been a nicer birthday gift for me. It came out on my birthday, which was quite surprising. And I don't know about you, but I'm already thinking about the next one. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we have some ideas for future books that we really want to do. So uh, now that we have given birth to this one and we have put it out there into the world, it is time now to start thinking about the next addition to the family. <laughs> All right. Uh, let us know what you think our next book should be, and we'll think about making it that. We're going to take a break here quick, and when we get back, we're going to talk about our six years on the road and changes that we've noticed over that time. We'll be right back. Chances are you've seen them on the road. That's because Blue Ox designs and manufactures the best towing products in the industry. Just look around. You'll find them on highways and campgrounds and anywhere you find people traveling in the great outdoors. Award-winning tow bars, base plates, and brakes, a full line of weight distributing hitches, adjustable ball mounts, and a new line of fifth wheel hitches. With Blue Ox, towing doesn't have to be a drag. To learn more about how Blue Ox can make your travel adventures even more stress-free, visit blueox.com. You know what it's like, chilling at the campground and then you catch the delicious scent of something good on your neighbor's grill. You'd follow suit, but the idea of grilling over a fire pit or lugging out the bulky outdoor stove is just too exhausting. That's where Otzi Grills comes in. Otzi Grills pack completely flat for easy RV storage, and when it's time to cook, the interlocking design is super quick and easy to assemble. Otzi Grills are self-contained and fueled by charcoal or wood. Available in three sizes, made in the USA with high-quality, durable steel, Otzi Grills are built to fit all your camp cooking needs. Otzi is offering RV Miles listeners 10% off when you visit otzigear.com and use promo code RVMILES at checkout, all one word. That's otzigear, O-T-Z-I, gear.com, promo code RVMILES. Get cooking today with Otzi Gear Flat Pack Grills. We're back and it is time to talk about our six-year nomadiversary and some of the stuff that we have seen change over the last six years, whether it's in our personal life or in camping in general. Yeah, so in six years, we have, we'll start kind of more personal. In six years, we have seen our home change three times. So we started off in a converted school bus that we converted ourselves into a home on wheels. After a couple of years of that, we moved into our travel trailer, the Heartland Pioneer QB 300. And then just, we just celebrated the one year and we just actually did an episode on this a couple of uh, episodes past. We just celebrated one year now in our fifth wheel, our Sabre 37 FLL. And I would say for me, like when I look at that transition between the bus to the trailer to the fifth wheel, 
that is completely due to the children. Yeah. That is as our, you see the progression of our boys getting older and the space that we live in shifting to accommodate the boys getting older. And I think in some ways too, you also see the progression of our business, the progression of needing a more dedicated space to work in. Yeah. And in order to do that, some things had to change. Well, we talked about on that last <laughs> episode about how we sit here and record these yes. podcasts, how we tried to do that in that Pioneer, uh, which was lovely, but it was uh, it was sort of you know, the side couch up against a window, dark in a slide, and it wasn't conducive for us to like sit yeah. in front of a video camera. Well, so I everything we recorded was outside. And I think some of that is also that over the last couple of years, we have really kind of doubled down a little bit on video. Obviously, at the beginning of the RV Miles podcast, we didn't want to put it on YouTube. We were really resistant to any sort of YouTube involvement at all for ourselves. And then we had to. And, and then, then we hated we it. Had and to. then we went back. And then <laughs> and then and then and that you know, in some ways it's been really lovely because I do think that it has required us to kind of up our game a little bit. And so I've been really thankful for that, like that we can continue to kind of evolve and that our homes have evolved as well yeah. in order to fit that need. But like when I look at the progression of how we've traveled, I, it feels very much like a progression of not only our personal life, but then our professional life as well. Obviously then, so we've kind of talked so over six years, what's changed is our home. It's changed a lot. But I, you know, I think too, what has changed for us is we've also encountered some things on the road that have changed us as, as people, not only in the way that we camp, but in the way that we view this world and the way that we move through this world. And I would say that really one of the biggest ones was obviously when you found that unknown mass like in your brain and we had to stop everything that we were doing and we were in North Dakota and you had to undergo that emergency surgery which resulted in three different surgeries over a course of five months yeah. I think that where we were as travelers before that because that was really the halfway mark it was about year three to where we became as travelers after that I think is is really that to me is a really definitive shift and who we were as, as RVers. I don't know if you feel the same way, yeah. but I, I see that as a really definitive shift. We were so appreciative of everything we had before, but we left, my not, we left that situation. And when we got back on the road, I had never, I had never felt so whole. Yeah, it felt really great to be able to explore the country again. It felt great to have that to go to. You know, if we had been living in a home, it would we would have had to find something else to sort of fill that. Like maybe we would have went on vacation or something like that. But it, it <laughs> I, would, that would have been it, fine. It felt great to have something to go to. And I know we've this is sort of our third like retrospective episode recently. We've done five years of the podcast. We've done a, a year in the saber. Um, so you know, this being about us a little bit more personally, I think. I, I think that experience, yeah, that gave me some perspective on on life. But really, more than that, traveling to all the different communities that we've been to over the years has given me real perspective on life. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think, you know, I, I'm not going to get political at all here, but the country, you know, feels very politically divided, right? We feel like people are separating further and further apart from each other when it comes to all sorts of social and political issues. It feels like that from social media. It feels like that from the news. But when we travel, I don't feel that. I feel like I see areas that are uh, communities that work together to solve problems, communities that go through so many big events together, whether it's horrible things like school shootings and um, natural disasters or, you know, uplifting events like, you know, your hometown won a national championship. That's the kind of stuff I, I see a lot from the road and it's really, really heartwarming. I see less crime on the road than, you know, gets portrayed in the media. I don't want to put a blind eye over the fact that there are some problems out there. Yeah. But 
but I see that it is not as insurmountable as it might seem, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think that makes sense. I think that we have to recognize the perspective that we're coming from and kind of recognize our own privilege within that perspective, for sure. I, you know, one of the things that I have seen and especially experienced um, recently with Henry and returning to Lurie Children's and and how all that has played out for him is that uh, there are always going to be uh, we have traveled all over the place and we have been into a lot of communities and like anything in life, like a job, uh, like friends, like school, like social activities, there are going to be experiences in which you know as you kind of come into that space that this is not a space where if I put down roots here I would feel an immediate into that community or that that community would have the things that speak to me as a human as an individual with individual tastes and wants and beliefs that is very true as we have traveled across this country and there's nothing wrong with that and I think that sometimes that's what leads to the division narrative that we look upon not not uh, for lack of a better word, fitting into something as a negative. Yeah. Now, there are some things that are negatives that you don't fit into. And there are things out there that I don't want to fit into, right? Like that yeah. just go against our beliefs as a family, as individuals. And so that's fine. My point being is that as we've traveled, I'm okay when I go somewhere and saying, this isn't for me. I'm glad that I experienced it. Yeah. But this isn't for me. And a great case in point with that, I think, is if we talk about our experience at NASCAR. Mm -hmm. We had a great experience at NASCAR from an insular perspective of what we got to do and how we got to interact there and in experiencing that. that. But when we left, we thought this wouldn't be something we would continue with. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing wrong with people who do. It just didn't work for us. Just like someone might go to the theater and be like, oh, you know, that singing and dancing up there. Yeah. That's not really for me. Yeah. I'm, I'm not a singing and dancing kind of yeah. person. But we are. And we seek that out, you know. Yeah. I guess I my point to that is that sometimes it feels like those things that might fit your personal life are only to be found in certain areas right and that these magical state borders that you know don't really exist (laughs) when you look from a satellite change things and and that's not the case at all i mean you can find what you're looking for in every place When, when you say i'm not going to a particular state because you don't like the politics of that state or something and whatever mm-hmm. side you're on and that doesn't matter to us um in in this sense but there is not a single state out there that is more than like i think it's like 56 percent republican 56 percent democrat yeah. right you're gonna you don't find walk, you're gonna find you don't your walk people. into that state and everything around you is red you're gonna you find <laughs> what you need you're gonna find what you want it where in whatever state you're in in the and that it's not really a concern. I, you know, I see people, there are, there are all kinds of rules and regulations that always come out of California, for instance, because it is the most popular, populous state in the nation. Mm-hmm. And when I see people say, I'm not going to California because X, Y, Z laws, but you, you're, that law is never going to affect you <laughs> yeah. in, your, in your visit to one of the most be- beautiful states in the country. And we've been fighting that narrative about Chicago yeah. since we started this podcast. Yeah. So from a really personal perspective of how we have seen the road, that's that's kind yeah. of where our mindset is over the last six years. Now, you know, something uh, a lot of people have asked us about is how have our travels changed? Yeah. And I would say that when I was thinking about this and I was thinking about that question was, and they had it in two form, how has your personal travels changed, but how have you seen the overall scope of uh, camping change in six years, which that in itself is, I think, an entire podcast. We'll do our best to kind of condense the answer. But personally, we have slowed way down. Yeah, we were. We, we always recommend people when they start off for full-time living to slow down, and that's partially because we moved too fast at right. first. Right, and it became impossible possible to keep up with everything. I also think that for some of us, some of us full-timers, not all of us, but some of us full-timers, 
COVID really drove home either I love going slow and not moving for weeks or months on end, or I can't stand this. I'm about to scream. I love moving quicker. Yeah. You know, but I think that in the beginning, I it took a lot of us, I think some full timers, it takes us a while to get to what our travel style is. But in the beginning, it's I'm going to see all 50 states in one year or two years and then I'm getting off the road and then you see those people four years later and they're like well I've been to like 30 states <laughs> you know because everything changes and so yeah. for us from a personal perspective we've become much slower uh, but also um, I think seeking out um, a little bit more normalcy like we stay home a lot more than we used to if that makes sense like I remember we would we would get into a place and it'd be like, let's find every hike and do everything. Yeah. We we must see everything about this place. That's that's a big thing for me. I, I've found like checking off lists of like whether that's a single location and doing all the things at that mm -hmm. location or going to all the national parks or going to all the states. That that is something that has changed for me where I feel like that is a thoroughly unimportant thing. Yeah, and it's tough when we go back into so for example, when we were in Amana for just a couple days mm -hmm. and I thought, oh my gosh, we've got to see, you know, I want to go in here and see every quaint little old timey thing available and go to every single winery. And, and that, I just, that was tough because you're only, we were only there for two days Yeah, and it really drove home why I do not like going into a place for just a couple days and kicking back out like a, a good week to two weeks before we move on. And then really just picking out one or two things because we have found that just staying home and being in our home and our family and doing things here is really quite lovely. Now let's talk about overall camping in general. Well, I, I, I know oh. that I, I know that objectively there are more people traveling. There uh -huh. are more people camping, more campgrounds are more booked than ever. But I'll say that subjectively, I haven't felt that change that much other than prices. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, so let's <laughs> let's talk obvious. It's gotten more expensive in a, in a camping world. Everything has. I My gosh, I had to uh, price out some hotels last night because Henry and I do have to fly back to Chicago. Uh, I was I almost passed out. And that was with getting the hospital rate at these you know, welcome to downtown Chicago. Um, pricing, uh, the number of people who own RVs, whether or not they're using them, there's more people who own them. There are more people camping and there are more private campgrounds being mm -hmm. built. I don't know. I don't have numbers on like what's happening on the state level and stuff. Very like that. little. There's, there's yeah. some of it happening. Uh, most of the money that is going to state, uh, and federal parks is to refurbish yeah, campgrounds. Much needed. There are there are some that are adding sites, um, some state parks that have added a campground, but but on the government front, it has it is much, much slower for municipalities to put in campgrounds than it is on a uh, on a private front. So there are there are a lot more sites out there, even though they still get more and more expensive. And I will I'm going to try to condense this, too, because I think this, uh, what I'm about to say, could also be its own very long discussion, that with all of this growth from when we started this in 2016 to where we are in 2022, is that we have, thankfully, begun to see a more diversified camping world, uh, mm -hmm. people that are camping. The, the landscape is changing. It's becoming more accessible to all people, and that is a really beautiful thing, and with that comes growing pains and there are growing pains in this community because this community has been and was one thing for so very long and it's it's shifting and it's becoming something else and this is across the board and so you will see growing pains be that in uh an online forum a facebook group at the campground uh even just the way well, you view camping the most obvious shift the biggest shift uh, along those lines is more families camping yes. um, as opposed to retired couples and, and so forth. So you're seeing lots more 
not just full-time families out there, but families camping and RVing in general. And because campgrounds are so full and busy, the places that don't really want to cater to families Mm -hmm. we're seeing a lot more of the 55 and older parks uh out there and uh that essentially are adult only and that can become a challenge in a lot of places yeah and so there is a sort of a budding of heads a little bit and you know uh Change can be hard, uh, especially when we have to turn in on ourselves and look at that change. And uh, it's much like we've talked about with the move to the electric vehicle and some of the places that that is going in this industry. Uh, it's happening. Yeah, you can whether come you want to do it or not, it's, yeah. it's happening. You, right? you know, you try yeah. to embrace it and come mm-hmm. along or you will be brought kicking and screaming like yeah. that's just kind of how that is. So I think that's what we have seen in the six years just from a broad perspective, I feel like we could talk about that forever. Um, I, I want to add one more thing about campgrounds, yeah. too. I, a lot of money has gone into campgrounds in the last few years. Um, and a lot of that has not been into new campgrounds, but has been into companies buying up campgrounds that were maybe older, you know, and built in the 50s and, and so forth and, yeah. and, and fixing them up. Uh, for better or worse. Sometimes that leads to them costing $120 a night. Um, (laughs) So, you know, we can go back and forth on whether that's a good thing or not, but there's a lot of money has gone into sort of uh, taking private parks and and, uh, sprucing them up a bit. Similarly, dealerships. Dealerships are becoming, um, there's a lot more chains, right? There are a lot more corporations that own many dealerships instead of the individual family-run dealership. And that's both unfortunate, but also necessary in order for some of those dealerships to be able to compete with the very, very large yeah. ones, right? So if you, you know, your small local dealership is joining forces with 30 others and, and becoming a small family-owned chain, that that's helping them survive against the megalith companies like Camping World out there. I should also say, too, that the, and I'm surprised we didn't bring this up, but in the six years, the the art of content creation sure. and the art of, you know, the RV YouTuber or across any social media has really become its own business, its own respected business, or at least it should be respected because this is how, as you are listening or watching right now, this is one of the ways that we all connect in the RV community. Yeah, and and not just folks like us, but even people who don't have an interest in this being their job. Right. You just have the ability to take your cell phone and go through a campground and and talk about it, or or you know talk about a, a national park service spot that you saw, at, just as a person with your own community. Um, that has been a, a an amazing thing to be able to go into like some of the Facebook groups and go into mm-hmm. Instagram and TikTok and and sort of get ideas about where to go and what to see. It is so much easier to find like great hikes to do, for instance, because you can sort of search those things on social media or go to your favorite social media group and and get recommendations. Yeah, it's really just when we started, our wondering family was kind of the first thing that we did, you know, started that family travel diary. And that was kind of the first thing we did when we got on the road or we were building out the bus. And then uh, it wasn't until about a year later that we started RV Miles. Um, that first year of just kind of creating content that was based on what we were doing. And, and at that time, it was really picture heavy. Like that's back when pictures and photos ruled the world. And to watch that progression um, and, and to see more and more people just enjoying sharing their content and, and creating that and finding joy from that as they, they travel around over the six years makes me sound so old because I'm like, oh, I've watched you all grow up. But we have all grown up as travelers in this sphere for better or for worse. A, a social media break is always good for all of us. But that is this, you know, it content creation now for RVers. It's amazing. It's just amazing what people can do and what they're doing. Yeah. 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 I mean, if you, uh, this has been going on for a while, but you need to fix something on your RV 
the quickest place you go is YouTube, right? You mm-hmm. you watch somebody change out a wheel bearing. Uh, that's how that's how you figure out to do it. Visual media is is such a unique tool for this thing that we do traveling in these big things and needing to fix them and all that sort of stuff. And now that we all have Starlink, we can do it even more. (laughs) So a few other things, and then let's wrap this up. Just a few other bullet points I put on here, like over the last six years and and especially in the last couple of years, what's changed for us is that we started traveling with friends more. That was not something we did a lot in the beginning. We were very introverted and, um, is sort of insular in how yeah. we traveled. And then over the last two years, we have been able to connect with a few different families that have, we've really bonded with and have kind of enhanced our experience by traveling with them. We um, always knew a lot of full-time families did that where they sort of travel in packs of three or four groups. Made and we uh, anxiety, like my anxiety would be like, but what if we I, don't get along? Yeah. I always thought it was strange. I don't, I thought, Oh, that's never going to be for us. How do we all plan that um, together? <laughs> that's crazy. I, this is coming from people who've yeah. literally built shows from the ground up working in a room with a bunch of other collaborators. And we'd be like, oh, I don't understand how they all booked a campground together. Well, it, it's, it's, <laughs> it's amazing. I mean, I suppose that's another big picture thing too, is that, we have sort of felt how small the country is. Yeah. We run into people we know, not just from, you know, not you all listeners and, and viewers, uh, but we run into people that we have met on the road all the time. Yeah. Uh, virtually. I'm talking to every other campground we're at. Yeah, you can't. At this point, you can't walk into. And you've been, uh, for people who've been on the road long enough, you can't almost walk into a campground at this point and be like, not knowing somebody. You yeah. know, you just you just do. Um, A few other things is uh, I put on here that I felt that our relationship, our marriage has become stronger since we were on the road. And hey, oh. maybe it would have gotten stronger in a sticks and bricks. Mm. Maybe it's just because we've gotten older and somebody has chilled out somebody not me yeah not me okay. not talking about me yeah. uh well somebody may feel it stronger and <laughs> no, i'm just kidding <laughs> wow oh wow i think i better get on better help clearly we need <laughs> clearly i'm the only one who feels like maybe they will sponsor good. us uh, <laughs> wow this no you're you're absolutely right it is our i mean our uh, I, I god jay uh, you're making me break out and sweat no, now a like of, <laughs> a lot of marriages uh I, uh, it just improve naturally over the years and a lot of them degrade over the years. I but know when you've been together as long as we have, I, I feel like there, ha- that there is something about traveling that, um, you know, it, we're a tighter knit family than when we were in Chicago. And part of that was sort of my work, but also mm-hmm. just like, you know, there's all the activities. Okay. These, this kid signed up for this, this kid signed up for this. There's moving around. There's doing this well, and there's doing that. We have out school for that now. <laughs> we, but, like, and now we do everything together. Right. Yeah. So, um, so both as a, a married couple and as a family, I feel like that has, uh, that has really been a, a strong point for us. Well, I would speak just, uh, for what we do for a living. And we've talked, I think, candidly about how working together uh, can be very difficult sometimes. We tend to uh, see things a little bit differently in decision making and we can butt heads a lot. But we've also talked about how once a week we get to sit down here with all of you and we get to talk to each other virtually uninterrupted. I have been, I have received, I think, three or four, if not five texts from my children since we sat down here, they're arguing with each other and they would like me to put the fire out. Uh, and they're literally arguing over whether they should be in the same room together. One wants the other person to leave, one won't leave, you know. They're it's at like, my parents' house, which is a four bedroom house that yeah. has a giant basement that's finished. <sighs> there are plenty of rooms for anyone to so be in. Many. They don't argue about who's in what room. Well, they do when we're in the, the trailer, but it, it's... It's like uh, their version of who's on first it, well, it's, you 100%. know when, when people say like you know don't how do you all get a, along in that tiny little space like that the kids are under your feet and arguing with each other in the tiny space and in the big space they're it over, doesn't matter yeah they're at grandma and grandpa's <laughs> big house right now and they're still yeah it doesn't matter still it's just like i'm not touching you i'm not touching you mm-hmm. yeah it's it's crazy but i point being is that even with that that's minor interruptions 
once a week, we get to sit down here. We get to talk to each other. We get to laugh. We get to laugh with all of you. We get to engage with, you know, you all with questions and whatnot. And I think that in some ways that has also really made our relationship a little bit stronger. And I don't know that we would have gone into this world if we weren't RVing. I, we probably would still be yeah. carving out a life in theater. And uh, whew, that had its own stressors. Yeah, life is just easier. I, a big yeah. part of that is working for ourselves, though, yeah. and not working for yeah. someone else. It is. It's a beautiful thing. There's it's, its own stresses. Well, I was going to say, it, it is. But it's, it, they're better. It's a blessing and a curse. <laughs> they're better. Because we answer to no one but ourselves. Yeah. and Then you want to answer to yourself all the time. But, yeah. But it is. Or you're like, oh, I'll just do it later. It is infinitely then, better than stressing over what your boss thinks. So, well, sometimes. I don't know. I think the beauty of going and leaving it all at the door when you leave for the end of the day is lovely. But isn't that the whole grass is always greener on yeah. the other side? And I am not going to sit here and even think about like what we have and this RV world that we are a part of and this community that we get to know. This is just exactly where we should be in life right now. I could not be more thankful for it every single day. So with that said, that is kind of us looking back as we continue to move forward at our six-year nomadiversary. Do you think, we're going we're gonna to say it right now, do you think we will be having this discussion six years from now on this podcast? I, I do, but it will be in a different way. God willing, we will still be working and doing this podcast in six years. Yes. <laughs> Episode 512 <laughs> will be my prediction. So that is it. If you have any comments you would like to share on this discussion or any observations about things that we have talked about, please come and chat with us over in the RV Miles Facebook group. You can leave a post there. And if you will tag Jason and I on it, that is a really great way for us to know that you're talking directly to us or, or at large, but you would like us to see it. And then, of course, if you're watching this on YouTube, you can leave a comment down in the description and we will also do our best to answer it there as well. Okay, we'll be back in a moment with our Fresh Tank Black Tank segment. It's time for a new RV mattress. Abby and I have been testing out the Wanderlust mattress from RVmattress.com by Brooklyn Bedding, and we couldn't be happier. We're sleeping better, and because we were able to customize the mattress, we got the exact fit for our needs. RVmattress.com offers a 120-night sleep trial, the ability to pick different sizes and thicknesses, plus their products are toxin-free, made in the USA, and incredibly simple to set up. We were able to have ours delivered to the campground, and within hours of unboxing, the mattress was fully expanded and ready to sleep on. RVmattress.com offers free shipping and is offering the RV Miles community 20% off. Visit RVmattress.com slash RVmiles and use the promo code RVmiles, all one word. That's RVmattress.com slash RVmiles with the promo code RVmiles for 20% off. Are you tired of overcrowded campgrounds and competing for reservations, paying high fees for sites? Well, ownership is a big trend in RVing that might be right for you. Tennessee Land and Lakes sells large acreage and waterfront RV properties in popular destination spots at amazing prices, 100% ownership. These large acreage properties are designed for privacy and surrounded by some of the most popular attractions in the country. Visit their website to explore ownership options. Tennessee is a great place to make your home base with 0% state income tax. No more calling around for reservations, your property, your way. For details, visit myrvland.land. That's myrvland.land. We are back and it is time to check the level of our tanks. Jason, what is in your black tank this week? My black tank is this new ruling from the U.S. Court of Appeals on filming in national parks and on public land. So I'm going to go through this in a lot more detail in the news video this week. Um, so check that out for sure. But essentially, you know, if you've been following us over the years, we've sort of followed this story extensively where some YouTubers were starting to get fined for filming in national parks. And usually what the National Park Service was doing was using this law that requires that they uh, collect fees for any commercial use of filming in, in parks. 
um, as a way to uh, stop behavior that they didn't like, but there isn't a, really a law for. Mm -hmm. So like base jumping, people jumping off of the top of a cliff with a parachute on their back, right? There's no actual law against that. And obviously it's something that we really don't want to happen in a lot of national park type spaces. But because there's no law against that, usually those people are like filming on a GoPro to put it on YouTube. The National Park Service would then charge them a fine for filming commercially in a national park. And, you know, it makes sense that we don't want like Hollywood movies moving into national parks sure. and uh, without getting a permit and without paying the taxpayers any sort of money for tying up those resources, if it's even necessary or um, reasonable that they do film in, in a specific spot in a national park. But this law was written in the days before YouTube. And now there are so many content creators like ourselves, um, mm -hmm. but also just anybody that is out and about filming the, the, the overturning of this ruling. So I guess what I go back, what happened was there was this law, people were getting fined for it. Somebody sued and it got overturned. So in the last year and a half, the national park service has not had any, any fees uh, or permits for commercial filming. So now the uh, national park service appealed and the law was overturned again. So now they have the right to charge permit fees um, for folks that are filming in a, in a national park. And it's not just national parks, it's any public land. And you think about that, you think about like hmm. the National Mall memorials where protests happen, stuff like that often. So what's concerning about this is not just that this law got overturned again and that um, now we're in a situation where people can't take out a camera and, and shoot any video in a national park if they ever intend to put it up. But there's also... Um, there's also a little bit more that went into this decision that it's concerning people that uh, that's essentially says that filming video is not free speech in general, that that that's part of the creation of speech, right? Saying that the final film is a commutative act of speech, but the process of filming it is not. So that's, that's a precedent. And we're talking the second highest court in the land here. That's a precedent that's concerning uh, to be set. And this could still get appealed to the Supreme Court, but who knows if that's going to happen or not, if the Supreme Court will take up the case. But it's concerning to us as content creators in general. Um, but I think there's a broader societal concern um, over sort of a limitation on free speech. What is in your fresh tank? This it's like week? 90 degrees in here, and I'm wearing <laughs> oh a long gosh. sleeve shirt because it's fall. It is I, not. I know fall no. is like September 21st, okay. but, you but are... <laughs> September 1st is fall. And Don't come at me with your weather start, fall. Like we're it's... heading to Colorado. I get to start wearing sweaters and and sweatshirts and pants no, you and don't. socks and shoes again. Do you not remember what RVE was like last year? It was year? very hot last it year. It was so hot last year it's gonna be you listen. it's gonna be a it's gonna be a, a brisk 60 degrees the whole time it's not just because you watched the today show today and dylan dreyer told you that this is the meteorological beginning of fall you are all of a sudden like it's fall y'all it's actually like an extreme heat wave happening in the west right now <laughs> it, so. yes uh, next thing i know you're gonna be standing around with your pumpkin spice, pumpkin latte, spice latte and your little vest listen, can i can i can i and... can i vent a little bit on the pumpkin spice thing only if you don't come after the pumpkin cold cream brew no no my, my, my issue is like people they're like i hate pumpkin spice everything why we got to put pumpkin in everything and the pumpkin spice and all that listen first care? of all there's pumpkin spice people get very confused about this <laughs> There's no pumpkin in pumpkin spice. There never has been. Now, Starbucks got sued over this and had to start putting pumpkin in their pumpkin spice lattes because it says pumpkin. But pumpkin spice is a, the spice mixture that you use in pumpkin pies. Yes. So when you say, I hate pumpkin spice, you're saying, I hate cinnamon and cloves. And nutmeg. And nutmeg. And, and you're probably wrong. some other stuff. Yeah, <laughs> you are very wrong. Like, we don't try whatever. to tell people. You can people, like whatever you like. But you ha you're still wrong. <laughs> like, you're still wrong. So, okay. Well, fall is approaching. 
And my, my hope and is that we're 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 spurring on fall by going to Colorado and getting into some elevation. I am not. You know how I feel. I love summer because what I fall is great, but for me, what happens is it just starts getting darker sooner and sooner. I love a good summer night where it's, you know, not sure. not it's nine nine thirty before the sun goes down, and it's just yeah. I love everything about that. All right. So, what's in your black tank this week? So my black tank, I alluded to it earlier. I said we've been singing the praises of Chicago for six years. That's never going to change. Uh, but we were just up there for five days. We took Henry up to meet the doctors at Lurie Children's. And there were some aspects of Chicago that clearly are the impact of probably COVID, are the impact of uh, maybe, I, you know, I don't follow the the politics of the city too much anymore, but also just the impacts of some really bad business deals made very, very long ago during the Daly administration. Uh, and the city uh, has lost a little bit of its charm uh, in regards to how it cares for itself. Yeah, I mean, this people that haven't been to Chicago, have, you know, have always been like, oh, it's, you know, it's a dirty, scary place. But actually, we have always said that the touristy areas are are some of the best touristy big city areas in the country. Yeah. They still are, but but it was dirty. I mean the the it, the public transportation, the streets, there's just no way around saying that it was Chicago is dirty right now. Yeah, and you know, it's not it has nothing to do with uh I think the narrative that always spins around Chicago. This is not the narrative along that. This is just, you know, uh downtown in the loop. Uh, has is looking like a ghost town. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not being cared for. What's interesting is that the neighborhoods seem to be seeing neighborhoods are rocking. The neighborhoods are rocking. I mean, we stayed in River North, and yeah. that place was booming. And the restaurants are amazing, and everything is there. But what's happening is that this the central, the heart of this city, this downtown, and even up as you, it's like the minute you cross over the Chicago River, the minute you head south off down Michigan Avenue and you cross that Chicago River, everything changes. Yeah, and that's kind of how it was back in the 90s. Yeah. And then and then the, the loop had sort of a resurgence, and it seems like it's gone back. When but I, I think the hardest thing for us to reconcile was just how they have just let the CTA, the Chicago Transit Authority, has for I know there's funding issues all over the place. Clearly, you know, raising rates as much as they have gone up is doing nothing. Yeah, because they, they they used to the the train station that I used to get off of to work downtown. Mm -hmm. I, I remember I remember seeing them power wash it at least once a month, like the yeah. whole thing, top so, to bottom, and it looked like we stopped at that stop, and it looked like it hadn't been done in years. I mean, the stops where you. Get off the train. I, I always used to compare my time in New York with my time in Chicago, and I would say Chicago, far superior transit system. It's cleaner. It's more efficient. It, you know, it's, I loved it compared to the New York system. I cannot say that now. However, now, the buses are where it's at. The buses, we, yeah, the buses were where it's at. There's a lot of new buses. Get on the bus. Literally, in every single, didn't matter what line you were on, didn't matter if you were getting off to go into some of the finest stores in the country, or if you were just getting off in a good old Chicago neighborhood, it was urine upon urine upon urine upon urine smell. It was atrocious. And I was like, I'm done. I'm done with this train. We're, we're taking buses, which thank goodness for the bus system and we were familiar with it, but I cannot imagine being a tourist. And yeah, and figuring that out. And yeah, figuring out hard. the bus system. Yeah, yeah. So uh, Chicago, get it together. Come on now. You're a world-class city. You're amazing and the most beautiful skyline in the world. Get it together. What's in your fresh tank this week? So my fresh tank goes to how we got to Chicago. So we took the Amtrak and we took the Amtrak from a, a little depot here in Galesburg, Illinois. It took about three and a half hours for us to get from Galesburg to Union Station. We had so much fun. I love rail transit. Yeah, it's, you know, it's like it would take the same amount of time. People fly from 
yeah. here to Chicago. Mm -hmm. It would take the same amount of time with the going through security and all that sort of stuff, but you get much bigger seats. You get oh. to walk around. You get much bigger bathrooms. You concessions. get concessions. You get to sit down. If you have the and, observation car, yeah. if you get one that has an observation car. I mean, this is, so I've gone from talking about just how sad the Chicago Transit Authority, the CTA, the trains were there, to really wanting to say, well done, Amtrak. Yeah. Incredibly clean, incredibly efficient. Everyone was very nice. Like, it was it was such a good experience, both heading in and heading yeah. out. Outlets well, I mean, to plug things in. Hold up. I will say this. The, uh, the Galesburg interactions were great. <laughs> the Union Station... Uh, conductor interactions were a little lacking in... Yeah, why are you at gate D? Because it says to go to Good gate D on the sign and on my ticket and everything. You're Dude. not supposed to be here. You're supposed to be at gate E. Well, maybe make a sign or like change the digital board to say go to gate E. Dude, I can't read your mind. I can't help that you changed your decision <sighs> but decided not to tell the hundreds of people that needed to get on this train. So... I just a fresh tank to Amtrak. I would love to see what it's like to experience uh, a longer journey. Maybe what a sleeper car situation is like. But whoa, those are expensive. Yeah. Wow. But anyway, um, I encourage you if you can ever just you know get out of the rig for even a day trip or you know a, a weekend trip and you can do it via uh, the Amtrak. Hopefully, you'll end up with a good experience like we had. That's it for this week's episode of the RV Miles Podcast. Yes, it is. Thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate having you here every single week. We'd also like to say thank you to our sponsors. If you think about it, please click through to something that they are sponsoring here on the show because they're sponsoring us is what helps keep these episodes free to you. Also, if you would like to talk to Jason and I, we're over at the RV Miles Facebook group. And if you're doing any shopping on Amazon, we hope you'll take us along with you. We are at amazon.com slash shop slash RV Miles. All right. Next time you see us, we will be in Colorado where Jason will be, I guarantee you, sweating. He will not be wearing, <laughs> he will not be wearing a fall sweater because he will be boondocking and it will be hot. <laughs> but until then, stay safe. Enjoy your Labor Day weekend and keep logging those RV miles. Bye, everybody. Thank you.